Hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Nee and welcome to the Electric Motor GP show. Uh, and today's going to be a little bit different from the previous videos I've posted. This video um, is coming as a request from a couple of people I, I was having chats with yesterday. So basically, um, we were hanging out uh, with mates yesterday and we were talking about electric cars. We talked about the EV revolution that's going on in China, the options that are uh, becoming available in Australia at the moment and how to know which car to pick, what are the things you need to be looking at. Now this video is one that I, I should have made um, months back and I was reluctant to do it for multiple reasons, one being the fact that I didn't want my bald head on um, on on YouTube and other um, social media platforms. Uh, but I did realize yesterday that there, there is um, a knowledge gap amongst quite a number of people and I thought, you know what, I'm not the most uh, educated on EVs, but I do have some, some information about it and I'm quite happy to share that information. So today we're going to look, talk about um, the things that you need to look at when you want to buy an EV. And we will then come down on batteries and then discuss batteries. Now, if you're looking at an EV, there are a few um, points that you need to have that you're going to checklist and tick the boxes worth to say, look, this is what I'm looking for. And does this car fit my needs? The first thing in there is the price point. You need to know if the car that you're going to be getting is going to be affordable for you and if it's going to meet the the requirements that you want. The next thing you want to figure out is the range and the, this is predicated on the type of battery that's in the car and the, the management system in the car as well. So after thinking about the range you want to talk about charging. Charging has to do with how quickly the car can go from 10% to 80% and this then gives you a a little bit of comfort in terms of range anxiety and whether or not uh, you're going to be spending a long time recharging the car if you're going on a road trip. If you're in Perth, you're in a little bit of trouble because the charging network in Perth and the WA is not great. If you're living in Melbourne and Sydney, it's slightly better. Um, there is rumours that there's going to be a significant upgrade on infrastructure and the WA government is doing a lot around this space. But whether that's going to be sufficient is only time will tell. And that's also going to be dependent on the adoption of EVs by multiple different groups of people. Once you've also considered um, charging, you also want to consider the technology in the car. So if you're a technophile, you would want to make sure that the, whichever car you choose has got a lot of um, gadget and gizmos that are going to make you happy. But even if you're not a technophile, the ADAS system is one of the things that you want to look at and make sure that it's got all the safety features that are going to keep you comfortable and keep your family safe and keep you safe. For today, we're going to be talking about batteries because once we've talked about batteries, it makes it easier for you to deal with almost everything else with regards to the car. Now, the major problem with with um, EVs previously was the size of the batteries, the expense of the batteries, and the range as a consequence of the batteries themselves. And thankfully, there's been a bit of a revolution in the battery industry in the last four or five years, and that is moving at a rapid space. You're going to hear the terminology LFP, you're going to hear the terminology NMC, you're going to hear the terminology solid state battery, and I'm going to try and clarify this three for you today and briefly talk about charging as a consequence. Now, charging as a consequence, it's got to do with something called the architecture, and we're not going to go into a lot of detail on the architecture today, we're just going to go briefly into batteries, briefly into the architecture, and briefly into charging. And then subsequently, we can go into more details as we go along. So let's start with LFP. LFP is lithium ion phosphate, okay? Now, this is um, a technology that was developed to counter the effect of cobalt in the EV um, battery space. 
Uh, this was because the mining of um, cobalt is mostly done on the African continent and it's done by a lot of uh, young kids who are, who are not adequately protected, digging into mines that are not safe. And there's been a lot of concern about uh, child labor and child uh, endangerment in the process of mining cobalt. So that's one part why NMC, which is nickel, manganese, cobalt. That's one part of the reasons why um, NMC's batteries are not as popular as they used to be. The other reason why um, they're not as popular is that they were also more flammable. They're not dangerous in the context of most of the uh, things you find online telling you that um, EV batteries are very flammable. Actually, the, the petrol... Um, Internal combustion engine is actually the most flammable. It's eighty percent, um, eighty to eighty percent more flammable than the EV batteries. The only problem with EV batteries is that it takes a lot longer time to extinguish the flames when it sets on fire. Now, there's been a lot of improvement in the battery management technology to make sure that the batteries themselves are more uh, are safer. And there's a lot that goes into trying to protect them from combusting in the first place. And that would segue to the LFP batteries in a moment. Now, the advantage the NMC battery has over the LF LFP battery, it's that it charges quicker, which means you can charge it very, very quickly um, using a DC uh, fast charging um, cable. The other advantage of the NMC battery over the LFP battery is the energy density of the battery. Now that's when things start to get complicated. Um, but when I'm doing a more detailed analysis of the batteries for you, I will discuss in detail what the energy density means and the impact on your battery life. The disadvantage of the NMC battery is that it cycles through the life cycle of the battery much quicker. So therefore, if you have an NMC battery, you're looking at potentially needing to have a replacement battery within seven to 10 years. <coughs> now, when you compare that to the LFP battery, it charges slower than the NMC and the energy density is lower than the NMC battery, which ultimately means that the range you can get out of the LFP battery is a little bit lower than the range you can get out of an NMC battery. But the life cycle of the LFP battery is significantly longer than the life cycle of the NMC battery. It's almost on a ratio of three to one. So you're most likely gonna get 6,000 to 9,000 cycles out of your LFP battery versus the three to 4,000 cycles that you'll get out of your NMC battery, which is why there's a lot of push, a lot of preference for a number of people to have the LFP batteries. That said, when you're going to dig deeper into the LFP batteries, there's a lot of improvement that's been done in this space by both Ketel, uh, which is the biggest battery company in the world, BYD and Geely. And when I'm going into um, the next video I'm going to do, which is going to be on the differences between LFPs and NMCs in more detail, I will explain to you the, the technological advantages that are, being, um, that are being explored at the moment. Now, I mentioned that I was going to briefly touch on architecture and I was going to briefly touch on charging. And both of them are intertwined. Now, the architecture of your car dictates how quickly you can do a DC charge on your car. So the basic architecture at the moment is the 400 volt architecture, which means you go from anywhere from about 90 volts and 90 kilowatt charging all the way up until about 400 kilowatt of charging. For the most part, you're not gonna achieve 400 kilowatts of charging on the 
400 volts of architecture. This has to do with the fact that not all the voltage that's going into the battery is actually retained by the battery and you're going to have energy losses. For the most part, the charging on the 400 volt architecture is usually somewhere at the maximum of about 250. And the best at getting the most out of your 400 volt architecture is Tesla. So your Tesla Model Y mostly runs on the 400 volt architecture and the Tesla Model Y can get you up to 220, 230 um, DC fast charging on, on the 400. The advantage of that is that in places where you've got fast charging up to 350, 400, then you know that your battery size can be charged from 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 80% much quicker. So the Tesla Model Y, for example, at 250 um, kilowatt charging on a DC charger will do 10 to 80 percent in 25 minutes. So which means if you are on a road trip and you get to a supercharger network that can do up to 300 or 400 volts, uh, 400 kilowatts, you can plug in your car, go and buy some food, go use the restroom, and by the time you come back in about 15, 20 minutes, you're already at 80% of your, of your charging, which is pretty good. The 800 volt is on the next level, and the level above that is the 900 to 1200 volt architecture, which you're not gonna find a lot of. The 800 volt architecture, we don't have a lot of charging in the Western world, but there are charges available in China. And this are capable of delivering up to 600 kilowatts of charging within, uh, via the DC fast charging networks. The advantage of that is that if you've got the 800 volt architecture and your batteries are compatible with it, you can do a 10 to 80 percent charge in about five to ten minutes depending on the size of your battery and when we come back and we're talking about the batteries in detail i will talk to you about the the size of your battery the kilowatt and the kilowatt hour the differences between that and what that means for you in terms of trying to charge your car now finally um dc fast charging which i said go in tandem tesla for example for its cyber um for its um trucks, the, the trailers, that they're, the semis that they're making, they're now actually capable of charging at 1,200 kilowatts uh, on, their, on their charging networks, which means they can charge relatively very quickly. And the supercharging networks in version 4 that's coming out at the moment is in the US is capable of supporting up to 500 to 600 uh, kilowatt charge in DC. Now, imagine a scenario where you've got a 100 kilowatt battery and you've got something that's capable of doing um, 500 kilowatts charging, which means in literally about a fifth of an hour, which is roughly about 12 minutes, you can go from 10 to 80% or even less. So that tells you how much this, this space is changing over the, over the future. So this is my brief summary of the things you need to look at in terms of trying to get yourself an EV. So we've done a, a, a brief touch through on, on batteries, on the architecture of the car, and on the DC fast charging. These are the things I would definitely tell you to look at um, primarily when you're trying to make up your mind what you want to buy. Now, the final bit of the jigsaw for you is that the bigger your battery, the better your range. But the advantage is some companies are very, very good at increasing the efficiency of the car. Tesla is one of them. Tesla gets um, about 14 to 15 kilowatts uh, hours per 100 kilometers, which is one of the best you can get on the market. Uh, the Onvo L60 is also very good at that. The Xpeng G6 also has very good efficiency as well. So these cars mean that for the size of the battery that you're getting, you will get more range out of your car. So for the Xpeng G6, the long range model, which has got the 82 kilowatt um, NMC battery, you get 570 kilometers of WLTP range on your car. Uh, on the Tesla Model Y, on the long range model, you get 520, 540 kilo, um, kilometers on uh, WLTP range and on the standard model you get 455 kilowatts um, kilometers on the 
WLTP cycle as well. So the battery does impact. The standard um, Model Y has got a 60 kilowatt hour battery. The, the long range has got an 82 kilowatt hour battery. And it just lets you know that, look, that there are options in here. So range anxiety is not one of those things that you need to be worried about in the context of if you're using it for a daily commute, even if you've got a 60 kilowatt battery and you're able to use that um, and you're able to get a 400 kilometer uh, range from your car, it means that on a single charge for the whole week, you can do all your movements around in your car. And if you're remembering to top it up every night when you come home, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about. So I will see you on the next one. The next um, um, video I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be talking about um, the ADA systems to look at the self-parking features that you want in your car, the features you want in the car that would um, encourage you to buy the car and which cars are likely to give you the best bang for your buck. So until the next one, take care of yourself and I'll see you soon.